um, thank, thank you all for coming to Straight Science. This is a evening presentation series for the public put on by UAF Northwest Campus in Nome and Alaska Sea Grant, UAF Alaska Sea Grant Marine Advisory Program, again, in the home office, given our situation this year. Tonight's speaker, we're really excited about Dan Rizzolo. He is a um, returning speaker. He was here in February and by popular demand, he has come back to give us a talk tonight on loons. Um, loons are very popular in Nome and we have them all five species and they're throughout our interesting area. Dan's talk's gonna be a little bit further north tonight up in the Chukchi um, when he was working with USGS. Currently, Dan is a wildlife biologist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and he works on endangered species recovery. He did give a presentation on spectacled eiders prior and now he's gonna talk about loons. So I think you are blessed with working with terrific species of birds. And with that, oh, I better let the audience know. If you are kind of new to Zoom, um, know that, and we do have a caller, so uh, I will um, say something to the caller too. But for those of you that may be new to Zoom, know that we'll, we'll probably do questions. Dan, do you want questions during or after? Uh, either works for me. Okay, so for that, if you want to go to the bottom of your screen, if you're on the computer and not on the phone, there's a little bubble that's uh, at the bottom and it looks like a little cartoon bubble, like someone's gonna say something and it says chat. If you click on that, you'll get a, a wind screen will open up on your right or somewhere on your, your machine, however you have it set up. And you can type in or sort of text in your uh, question. I'll be monitoring that while Dan's on the, on the spot giving his presentation. So we'll work in tandem like that. Um, for the caller, I would say um, welcome. And where, where are you calling from for the caller? So we do have one caller and that's tough to be a caller on a Zoom call. If they um, can speak up, I will email them the presentation so they can follow along. Or they can text my, um, if they're with someone, they can text my cell phone, which is 907-434-1149. And know that when we get to the end of the presentation, or if you have any question during the presentation, if you're a caller, please ask your question, uh, feel free. We'll get to you first because it is difficult to be a caller uh, on a Zoom on a Zoom event. So, with that, thanks for your patience, audience, and thanks for your patience, Dan. Let's hear about um, loons. Great, thanks, Gay. Can you just making sure you can hear me and see my slides? Okay, still absolutely, Excellent. loud and thanks. clear. All right, thanks everyone for sharing your evening with me. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to spread the word on uh, an online viewing of some really cool short films about loons in Alaska. And that's being hosted by the Alaska chapter of the Wildlife Society online tomorrow between 12 and 1 p.m. Alaska time. And you'll need to go to a link that is here in this ad and Gay's gonna put it in the chat as well to register and once you register, they'll send you the link so that you can tune in. There'll be a, several films, one on loon migration, one on changes in Arctic lakes, one on contaminants, another on genetics, and then also a film on the Pacific loon pair that nests out of uh, Connors Lake in Anchorage that has the loon camera on the nest. Um, so check that out. If, you're, if you like loons, you'll, you'll uh, appreciate that. And they're all student produced films. So it's, it's an excellent, opportunity to see some student work. And tonight I'm going to be talking about um, some work I've been involved with either indirectly or directly um, and it's work that's been going on for two decades now out of the U.S. Geological Survey Alaska Science Center. Most of this work or all of this work has been led by Joel Schmutz here on the left. Uh, I'll be presenting results 
also from work done by Sarah McCloskey and Brian Urcook on the movements of loons marked with satellite transmitters, as well as some of my own work on diet and chick provisioning. Um, and just for the record, that's not a live loon on Joel's pack, that's a decoy. I don't think animal care news would allow transporting a live bird that way. There have been a lot of people involved with this work over the years. This list is not exhaustive, so apologies to anyone that I mistakenly left out, but thank you to all who uh, enabled this work. It's certainly not easy to work with loons. They, they breed in, in winter in remote areas and they're not easy to, to capture. So it takes a lot of help. So acknowledging that and appreciating that help. I wanted to start with my, my favorite loon story. Loons, loons are such obvious birds, even if you're not a birder, you know a loon. Um, so there are lots of stories about loons and I wanted to start with my favorite uh, called Lamach. Um, and it's a story told throughout the Arctic and subarctic cultures. And this depiction of the story here is by an artist, Alexander, Alexander Agnaluk out of Kudluktuk and Nunatuk. Um, Nunatuk. And the, the plot of the story revolves around a boy who's blind and in an attempt to regain his sight, he takes hold of a loon right as that loon dives underwater. And the loon dives deeper and deeper and the boy struggles to hold on uh, and as he's running out of air and he's, he's having difficulty holding on right about at the point where he's about to run out of breath and fears for his life, the loon surfaces and the boy has regained his sight. Um, the story also involves abuse and betrayal and revenge, but uh, I'll focus on the loon part of it and the part about gaining sight, both in terms of understanding and knowledge. Um, some of the information I'm sharing tonight actually required actually swimming with loons to get. Um, and the work has certainly brought some interesting insights on these cool birds. So take a deep breath as we start this dive together. So I'm gonna start with the what and who of loons and then summarize work by my colleagues on the where, where they go when they're not in Alaska, and then some of my own research on what they eat and how they feed. So starting with the basics, you know, loons are a, a, a fairly ancient lineage of birds. If you look in your bird book, depending on how old it is, if you have an old edition, loons might be the first species listed in the book. Um, within the last 10 years, they've revised, revised the phylogenetics of birds. Um, and they're actually, if you have a recent edition of a bird guide, they're a little farther back now. Um, but they are an ancient lineage that evolved, uh, that emerged 70 million years ago. Currently, there's a single family, the Gavidae, with a single genus, Gavia and five living species of loons. Interestingly, the current thought is that the closest living relative to loons are the procellarids, so the albatross, petrels, and shearwaters. And that might seem a little odd until you think of diving petrels. Uh, and the thing that unites those, those two, uh, two groups of birds relates to their chicks. So interestingly, loon chicks, they're, they're, they are hatched with a, a, a coat of down feathers and then during the growth period, they actually molt into a second coat of down feathers, which is really a unique thing for a bird to do. And that's a trait that they, sheer, they share with um, the procellarids as well as the, the penguins. Loons are very distinct in appearance, not just in their plumage color and pattern, but also in their body shape and wing shape and wing beat. They, they're, they're a fast flyer. And when you think about their body shape, they are a trade-off between the demands of diving and the demands of flying. So they are excellent divers. They're heavy bodied. If you look at the legs, their legs are set very far back. So they, they actually can't walk very well on land to push themselves along. Um, their bill is long and pointed, great for catching fish, um, but they also have to fly. They're, you know, the extreme of being a good diver are the penguins. Um, the penguins don't need to migrate thousands of kilometers. Um, loons do. So they also have to fly, but that heavy body mass is a lot of burden on their wings to fly. So they, they are what, what's considered a high wing loading species. But interestingly, their wing shape is very different from other uh, high wing loading species. They have long pointed wings. 
Um, and Jim Lavorn from Southern Illinois University wrote a really cool paper about the biomechanical conflicts between flying and diving and kind of arrived at this hypothesis that if you think about a loon compared to another high wing loading species like a puffin or a mer, loons have zero reason to be maneuverable. They're not flying and perching on cliffs. They're only ever landing on open water. So they're not constrained to be maneuverable in any way. So that instead, they fly fast. And that's what that wing shape gives them. And that, again, that's from Jim LaVorne's paper. It's one of my favorites about loons and other species. So I guess to go through the, the five species of loons, um, the most well-known is the common loon because it nests in places where people um, nest as well. So their distribution follows the distribution of the boreal forest down into Minnesota and Wisconsin and the northern part of New England. It's a large body loon, five kilograms or 11 pounds, and it breeds only in North America and um, Greenland. Um, it does not nest in coastal tundra, uh, so I won't be talking much about common loons tonight. They do nest in Alaska. In Alaska, there are recent studies by Lauren McDuffie, uh, studies as well by Tamara Zeller, Fish and Wildlife Service, if you're interested in reading more about in common loon populations in, in Alaska. The common or the yellow-billed loon is the, the tundra nesting version of the common loon. So they are similar in size, behavior, appearance, and vocalization. Um, common loons and yellow-billed loons diverge from a common ancestor during the Pleistocene glaciation. Yellow-billed loons breed in tundra habitat, coastal tundra habitat through North Amer America and Asia, uh, primarily in Siberia. In Alaska, there are about a thousand breeding pairs on the Arctic coastal plain, uh, another 250 breeding pairs on the Seward Peninsula there near, near Nome. That Seward Peninsula population is monitored by the National Park Service. That's work that's led by Mel Flammy. I know Mel gave a talk in the Strait Science series about her work last fall. In addition to that work, there's work by the USGS that I'll be talking a bit about tonight, uh, as well as other work on the Arctic Coastal Plain by Rick Johnson and Julie Perret at ABR. Typically, yellow-billed loons nest and raise chicks on large lakes, so over seven hectares. Um, and you might remember that they were petitioned to be a candidate or listed under the Endangered Species and Act in 2009. And then in 2014, the service um, concluded that listing was not warranted. And that listing was mainly motivated by the fact that they're a small population with a very discrete and isolated distribution, which are two things that make, make a species pretty vulnerable in terms of conservation. Uh, they have beautiful calls um, that a lot of you might be familiar with. I'm gonna play one for you now. It starts off in a yodel which is the territorial call that's made by males only. And then it ends in a, a tremolo, which is made by both males and females. So hopefully this works. And to a lot of you, I know that's kind of the sound of home or the, the sound of the tundra. And for folks tuning in from the lower 48 that kind of share their summers with loons, that's a, a familiar call as well, because common loons sound very familiar to that. The Pacific loon is about half the size of a common loon in yellow billed loon. They breed both in coastal tundra and boreal habitats in North America. So their, their range overlaps with both um, yellow-billed loons and to some extent common loons. They nest and raise young uh, on small and large lakes. Um, and they also have a yodel, which again is a territorial call by the male. And then uh, I'll play two calls. The first is the yodel and, yodel and the second is a whale. All loons also have a whale call. And true to its name to the human ear, ear it sounds very sad and mournful. And it, it always reminds me of a story that a friend in Point Lay told me. Um, the reason that loons sound so sad is because they dive so deep that when they surface, they bring back calls from the dead. And ever since I hear, I've heard, was told that story when I'm walking the tundra and I hear a whale call from a loon, it's, uh, it's a, a bit spooky. So here we'll start with the yodel.
and here's the whale. So here's an interesting species, the Arctic loon. So the Arctic loon is a Eura is the Eurasian cousin of the Pacific loon. It's similar in appearance, vocalization, and behavior. And in fact, it was considered the same species, both common or, um, Pacific loons and Arctic loons until 1985, um, where they were separated based on differences in plumage, size, and the fact that where their distributions do overlap, that they don't interbreed. And that's been confirmed through genetics. So it breeds primarily in Eurasia, the UK, Scandinavia, Siberia. Um, there's some breeding in Western Alaska and Bering Strait region. So that Eurasian population stretches east just enough to reach the Bering Strait region of Alaska. And they're recognizable uh, and differentiated, different from a Pacific Loon base. On one thing, this, which is most obvious to me, this white patch uh, on their, their rear, rear flank. Um, I know when Park Service does their surveys of the Seward Peninsula, they actually, from the air, can differentiate, and if Tamara and Mel can differentiate between Pacific Loons and, and Arctic Loons. So they're actually starting to collect data on this, the Alaska population of, of Arctic Loons. And last and least, because it's the smallest of the loons, and in my opinion, the most unique and interesting, is the red-throated loon, which is small, so less than two kilograms, around four pounds. Um, anatomically, it is very different from other loons. It has uh, specializations you don't see in the other loons, larger body loon species, but phylogenetics shows that its small body size is in fact kind of the ancestral or primitive state for loons, that loons back in evolutionary history were small bodied. Red-throated loons likely evolved from an ancestral species that was isolated in high latitudes during um, glaciation, a period of glaciation. And that small body size is actually adapted for using the small lakes that were the first to melt out and actually were only open for a usable part of the, the breeding season. Sister species that were isolated farther south didn't face this constraint and evolved to larger body size. And that divergence happened around 7 million years ago. So they're small, so they don't need much room to take off and land. So they can use really small lakes. And these lakes are often shallow enough that they do not, that they do freeze completely in the winter. Because they do freeze completely in the winter, they do not have fish in them. Um, but they do need to eat when they breed and nest. So to do that, they actually fly to separate foraging habitat. And that foraging habitat is typically in the marine environment. So they're flying to the ocean from their nesting lake to capture fish during incubation and chickering. And then during chickering, they're capturing a fish, one fish at a time, to carry back to feed their chick, much like a seabird nesting on a cliff does. And I'll play, that's a very, you know, so their, their plumage isn't as, to our eye, isn't as elaborate as, as the other species of loons. And their vocalizations are also quite different. I'm gonna play uh, what's called a plesiosaur call. And it's actually a duet. So both the male and the female are making this vocalization. Uh, I've seen them, they make this often when one of the pair returns to the lake. So I think it's important for maintaining pair bonds. And then if another red throated loon flies over their breeding lake, they often engage this call. So it also seems to be a territorial call. But in this instance, it's a ter call, territorial call by both the male and the female together. Not quite as melodic as the other moon species. Uh, one interesting fact is that the Bering Strait is one of the few places you can see all five loon species in breeding plumage. So that the common loon distribution reaches just into the each, eastern part of the Seward Peninsula. And then that very eastern part of the Arctic loon population stretches just into Alaska, into the Seward Peninsula as well. So loons are most visible during the breeding season when they're inland and breeding plumage, but most of the year they have very much less impressive feathers. So this is a yellow bill loon in wintering plumage, and they live in the marine environment away from Alaska, often very far. So where do they go when they're not here? So the U.S. Geological Survey Alaska Science Center has been putting satellite transmitters a few at a time 
and looms over the past 20 years. So I'm going to show some maps summarizing those results. And I'll start with yellow billed loons. And these data are courtesy of Joel Schmutz and Brian Will Cook. Um, and we'll start with birds breeding on the Arctic coastal plain in the top panel. And you can see that birds that breed in the Arctic coastal plain of Alaska migrate westward to Asia. So they have wintering sites in the uh, archipelago of Japan, Hokkaido Island, out to the Korean Peninsula, and then into the Yellow Sea. So 93% of the transmitters deployed from the, the Arctic coastal plain went to Asia for the winter. 7%, the ones that remained, went throughout the Aleutian Islands, so not nearly as far. So over time, there have been 17 transmitters deployed on yellow-billed loons breeding on the Seward Peninsula. Uh, about just over half also migrated to Asia, Hokkaido Island. Uh, the remainder, just under half, went to the Aleutian Islands. We'll get now into uh, red-throated loons. And this, these figures are from a paper by Sarah McCloskey. Um, and like yellow-billed loons, most red-throated loons breeding in the Arctic coastal plain winter in Asia. Um, in a similar migratory route across the Chukchi Sea down along Kamchatka and then over to Hokkaido, Japan, Korean Peninsula and into the Yellow Sea. There's always an outlier. One bird did his own thing and, and migrate, stayed in North America, migrated along the West Coast down to the um, mouth of the Colorado River in the Gulf of California. In 2001, six transmitters were put out in birds from Cape Espenberg on the Seward Peninsula. They all stayed in North America. Some wintering pretty close by in Prince William Sound, Cordova, Cape Fairweather, and then down to Vancouver Island, Puget Sound, and the mouth of the Columbia River. Seven transmitters from the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, 2000 to 2001. Again, they stayed in, in the west coast, along the west coast of North America, from Alaska down to southern BC and then to San Francisco Bay. And then in 2000 2001, five transmitters from the Copper River Delta. These birds again stayed in, in along the west coast of North America. Uh, some Prince William Sound wintering sites, um, Haida Gwaii, Peugeot Sound, down as far south as the west coast of, of Baja, California. So in summary, there's similar migration pattern across species. Um, there are also PTT results from work with Pacific loons by Autumn Lynn Harrison. And those, I'm not going to show those, but those showed the same patterns. Loons breeding on the Arctic coastal plain, migrating mostly to Asia and those from the YK Delta staying along the west coast of North America. Well, what are, what's the status of their population? So here are annual counts of yellow-billed loons from the Arctic coastal plain from the Fish and Wildlife Service is uh, their annual aerial survey um, over the last three decades, showing you know, over the long term a fair, fairly mild increasing trend over the most recent 10 years, there, there might be some suggestion of a, of a decline there. These are the population trends for red-throated and Pacific loons. The top panel is that same Arctic Coastal Plain survey. Um, and the lower panel are, is from the North American Breeding Waterfowl Survey, which is conducted on the same set of wetlands south of the Brooks Range every year. Um, and the interesting comparison here is looking at the amount of variation in count. So red-throated loon populations are really defined by these periods of increase, decrease, increase, decrease. They're much more variable, increase, decrease, much more variable than Pacific loons that, are, that show annual variation, but it's around what's otherwise a fairly stable population trend. So this contrasting variation and abundance over the years raises some uh, interesting questions. Um, are there differences in foraging behavior and diet during the breeding season that might contribute to these population level differences? So how does diet of 
the diet of closely related species that breed in similar habits, how do they differ and what are the consequences of those differences? And this is work that I did uh, along the Chukchi Sea Coast near the village of Point Lay. Um, great place to study loons, lots of loons. Each one of these dots represents a nest over the three years of the study. Uh, red dots are red-throated loons, blue dots are Pacifics. And you can see that they're neighbors and there are lots of them here. There are lots of nests to, or lots of wetlands, lots of lakes for them to nest on. A lot of them are in these drain lake basins or in uh, river deltas. And there are also, there's also a diversity of uh, foraging habitats. So freshwater lakes, freshwater rivers, brackish Pacific Lagoon, and then the Chukchi Sea as well. So you can see that they're, they're nesting right next to each other. Um, they're experiencing the same weather, the same climate, the same predators and predator abundances each year. So I have to pause just for a moment to acknowledge the community of Point Lay and their support for this project. Um, it just so happened that the highest density of breeding loons that we encountered kind of in pre preliminary work was around Point Lay on Point Lay land. So I had to get permission from the village and from the, the local um, uh, village corporation to work on those lands. They didn't have to give that to me, they did, and they were very supportive and helpful of my work, and that's something I'm very grateful for. I was fortunate to have been there in 2009 when the community resumed spring whaling and landed their first bowhead whale in 75 years. And this photo is from that Molokotuk celebration. Uh, my time there also had one of the high points of my career to date, and that was the opportunity to be a judge in the best donut competition in the 4th of July uh, barbecue. I love donuts. Um, and that's a good segue into diet. So loons don't eat diets, they mostly eat fish. And most of the time they consume their prey underwater. So diet composition is not well understood for that reason. You can't directly observe what they're eating. Um, there are ways around that. So we, can, we can't directly observe diet, but we can indirectly based on the composition of prey and the composition of tissues in the loons. So these are what are known as biotracers of diet, and they include stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen. Um, in the Straight Science talk last week by Hector Douglas, he showed how he used carbon and nitrogen to follow changes in diet, the diet of auklets from little diamond in response to changes in ocean conditions. Um, another biotracer um, is fatty acid composition. Um, these are the individual types of molecules, fatty acids, that compose adipose tissue. You might know fatty acids from diet supplements. Some people take like omega-3 fatty, omega fatty acids from fish, fish oil. So these biotracers work based on the idea that you are what you eat. So if you know what potential food items an animal might be eating and sample those and measure these biotracers and then collect tissue samples from the predator or consumer, you can reconstruct diet composition. Not exactly, but with enough resolution to gain some valuable insights into what they're eating. Um, so to do this, we had to collect prey and that's what um, is going on in this picture Kelly's doing here. She, we used an otter trawl to sample in Kazooka Lagoon and Chukchi Sea. We also sampled in lakes and rivers um, for fish and invertebrates. And if you're a loon around Point Lay, here's what's on the menu. If you're going to the seafood restaurant, uh, saffron cod, least cisco, rainbow smelt, four horn sculpin, arctic flounder, three spine stickleback, slender eel blenny. Here's an arctic cod, a uh, capelin, and a sand lance. If you're eating in the from the freshwater menu, most of what you're eating, most of what's available are invertebrates. There are arctic grayling. Um, adults are too large for loons. The, the juveniles are just about the right size. There aren't many of them though. Uh, Alaska blackfish and a nine spine stickleback are the fish. And for invertebrates, caddis fly larvae, primarily detisid beetles, um, clam, sh clam shrimp, which are uh, diplostraca, fairy shrimp, which are anastraca, and then tadpole shrimp, which are nodostraca. Uh, we also had to, to capture birds to collect blood and, and um, adipose tissue samples from the birds. Um, so that's what we did. Um, and we also used an approach to look at body condition. 
Uh, so how much, what are, how much fat each bird was carrying as kind of a reserve, a fuel reserve. Um, and to do that, we used an approach called um, deuterium dilution, which measures total body water. So the amount of water in a bird in this case is negatively related to how much fat it has because fat does not contain water. So a very lean bird that does not have much lipid reserve will have higher total body water, whereas a bird with a lot of lipid reserve will have uh, less total body water. So we use that as an indicator of fitness. Um, and we were able to capture over the three years of the project, 33 Pacific loons and 43 red throated loons. So to start with their diet, the prey items and how much lipid, how much fat, how fatty these different prey species were. Here they are all ranked kind of in fat content, proportion lipid, um, showing that, you know, first of all, freshwater invertebrates aren't very good. They don't have uh, much energy. They don't offer much energy. Most of what they have is an indigestible chitin shells, the exoskeletons. This five species, uh, with the highest energy density were fish species uh, and three of those five were marine fishes. So Arctic cod, uh, sand lance and Lucisco were the marine species and then nine spine stickleback and Arctic grayling were the freshwater species that really had high lipid content. We'll get into the stable isotope results here. Um, why do we use stable isotopes? What information are they, they providing us? Well, Stable isotope concentrations of carbon, which in this plot will be here along the x-axis, are telling us something about the environment that the prey come from. Uh, freshwater organisms have a more negative stable isotope signal for carbon than marine organisms. So stable, carbon stable isotope concentrations are telling us about freshwater versus marine habitat. On the other hand, nitrogen stable isotopes are telling us about what trophic level that species feeds at. So as you go up the trophic levels, the stable isotope uh, concentration of nitri nitrogen gets heavier. So when you go from phytoplankton to zooplankton, and then from zooplankton to fish, and then from fish to fish that eat other fish, each one of those changes uh, is about a three per mil increase in nitrogen. So this y-axis is telling us about what the trophic level of the prey is. So when we look at data from the prey samples in terms of their stabilized to ratios of carbon and nitrogen, you can see the blue dots here are all the marine fishes and they're clustered together with not a lot of variation. Um, intermediate are the freshwater fishes and uh, some of the invertebrates, Nodostraca and Diplostraca. And then the rest of the marine, uh, the freshwater invertebrates are lower down on the trophic scale. So here we have primarily freshwater prey and marine prey. So the, these prey species separate fairly well in terms of uh, stabilized to ratios of nitrogen and carbon. When we look at values measured from the plasma uh, from loon blood samples, we see similar clustering of red-throated loons, which are the circles here, in the area where you'd expect high trophic level marine diet. What's interesting is the variation you see in Pacific loons. So you have some Pacific loons, you know, each one of these symbols is an individual value from an individual loon. Some of these Pacific loons are feeding just like red-throated loons, a marine diet, whereas others are feeding in the freshwater with ranges that go from one habitat to the other. So some are freshwater feeders, some are marine feeders, some are mixed diet feeders. So that, that variation in, in Pacific loon um, stabilized to values in diet is, was, was, is very interesting. We can combine the values from the prey. And in this case, we grouped suites of prey items that had similar stabilized to ratios together. So we have marine fish, and then least cisco, which is an amphidromous fish, it migrates in and out of marine habitat to freshwater, so it has an intermediate value for carbon. And then freshwater invertebrates. We can combine those three groupings of potential prey with the plasma values from the two species of loons to get an estimate of how these three prey categories compose their diet. 
And those models showed that, so here looking at the prey categories, freshwater, least Cisco and marine, for Pacific loons in the gray here, their diet on average, so this is the average diet across all samples, is about 25% uh, freshwater, 75% marine. In contrast, the red throated loons, not surprisingly, are 100% marine fish as we expect because they're flying out to the ocean to feed. Interestingly, no one was eating least cisco, and that's consistent with our observations from the field because least cisco really didn't show up in the system until late summer when they came to spawn. So they weren't available during the, the incubation period. So these values are from blood plasma, which integrates diet over the most recent few days relative to when the sample is collected. The model will also estimate diet proportions for each individual in the sample. So along the x-axis here is each individual Pacific loon that we sampled. And it's showing the proportion of marine prey in the diet. Again, showing that variation where some individuals had very little marine prey, 10%, and then others had nearly all marine prey with a bunch of individuals in between. So what explains that variation? So looking at sources of variation, the variable that most explained variation in the diet of Pacific loons was size of the, the nesting lake. So lake surface area. And so here it's lake surface area in relation to proportion, diet proportions where the black line is freshwater fish and the gray line is marine fish. And you can see for at about 15 hectares, any lake that's 15 hectares or less, the diet was mostly marine. So Pacific loons and small lakes for eating marine fish. After 15 hectares, the diet switched mostly freshwater prey. What about the other biotracer I talked about? So here are here showing us some fatty acid results. These are five fatty acids um, measured in all, across all of the potential prey species just showing that you can differentiate between prey species based on the composition of fatty acids in their, in their lipid. Um, so it's kind of like a signature, a fatty acid signature, a fatty acid um, fingerprint in a way. Same thing with loons, that fatty acid composition was able to distinguish between red-throated and Pacific loons. The real benefit to using fatty acids is that instead of using just two elements, to get some inference in the diet instead of just carbon and nitrogen, you're using 40 types of fatty acids. So you're getting much better resolution. So instead of estimating diet as marine or freshwater, you can often get down to species or species groups. And here is the average diet for Pacific loons determined through fatty acids. In some cases, fatty acids had to group species because their fatty acid profiles are similar. And it's probably the same thing that you are what you eat. So in this case, Saffron cod and forehorn sculpin had similar fatty acid signatures, probably because they were eating similar foods themselves. Um, the other grouping was capelin, sandlands, and rainbow smelt. And you can see the average diet of Pacific loons included a diversity of marine fishes, freshwater fishes, mostly nine spine stickleback, as well as freshwater invertebrates. The model kind of combining um, all those species into freshwater and marine groupings and then looking at variation across individuals. So these are again results from fatty acids showing individual diets in terms of marine uh, proportion of prey and marine prey in the diet. You can see again a lot of variation among individuals and we compare this to the patterns that were shown in the stable isotope results they're consistent with, indiv indiv consistent with in individuals. So uh, this is giving us more confidence in the results that we have these two independent measures of diet telling the same story. Keeping the fatty acid results grouped as proportion of freshwater prey uh, and looking at the relationship with lake uh, surface area, same pattern emerges. So here we have lakes out to 120 hectares there weren't many large lakes in the study area. Most lakes were small, but you can see across the full range of lakes, the proportion of freshwater prey in the diet increased with lake size. When we limit it to lakes just 15 hectares or smaller, the same pattern emerges. Um, the, the smaller the lake, the more marine prey, the larger the lake, the more freshwater prey. The benefit is with fatty acids, we know it's driving that pattern. 
nine spine sticklebacks were what were just driving that pattern. So these loons that were using the larger lakes, that larger proportion of their diet that was fresh water was composed of these nine spine stickleback. And if you remember, if you look, think back to the uh, lipid content across prey types, nine spine stickleback were a species with similar lipid content to marine fishes. So we know this pattern was driven by nine spine stickleback. <clears throat> this suggests that, you know, that in larger lakes, there's, across lakes, there's some threshold. So at, a, at some size, the lake can't support uh, overrunning nine spine stickleback populations because it freezes solid or because it's, uh, when it gets repopulated in the spring during flooding, it doesn't support enough fish to make foraging locally profitable to that Pacific moon. So instead, in the smaller lakes, they're flying to the ocean. What about red-throated loons? Red-throated loon diet was diverse. Um, they weren't keying in on any one species. Uh, slender eel blenny was a high lipid content species that was important in the diet, as well as this capelin sandlance rainbow smelt group. But you can see that they're a fairly gen uh, generalist feeder that they're eating what's available. So now we get to the so what? Question. So we've documented differences in how red-throated loons and Pacific loon feed and what they're feeding on. What are the consequences of those differences? And so this is what we looked at using total body water. We use those measurements to create what I'm calling here a fat index, which is a, a ratio of fat mass to lean mass. Uh, and as you can see the axis here, lower values indicate loons with less fat, higher values indicate loons with uh, higher amounts of fat. And when we look at, compare the two species, you can see that there's no difference between Pacific loons and red-throated red loons that we sampled in terms of body condition. So kind of looking back at the habitat and where these birds are nesting, um, red -throated, all of these red-throated loons indicated by the red points here, they're all flying out to the ocean to be on marine fish. The Pacific loons that are in these larger lakes they're eating local. So they're eating nine spine sticklebacks in their local lake. The Pacific loons that are in these smaller lakes are behaving much like red throated loons and flying to the ocean. So they're able to use these smaller lakes that don't have large amounts of prey by getting a, a saltwater marine subsidy, basically using saltwater fish. So despite these differences, we didn't see an effect on body condition. This is likely a result of the birds that we were sampling. Um, we captured loons near hatch, otherwise they're really difficult to catch. They're way too cautious. Um, by late incubation, it's likely only those individuals that were in the best condition for breeding or were available to sample, or perhaps only the individuals in best condition even attempted to sample, or uh, attempted to breed and were available to sample. But what about the chicks? Uh, both red-throated and Pacific loons hatch for coastal chicks, so they leave the nest bowl within 24 hours of hatching. They move around on their own, but they are fed by their parents. Both the male and the female provision the young. Um, maximum brood size for loons is at most two chicks. Um, so we looked at what the adults fed their chicks and how often they fed the chicks. And I'll just summarize the what they fed part of the question and look at the consequences of that. All this information was collected the old fashioned way, spending lots of time in a blind with a spotting scope directly observing loons and their young. So across observations for Pacific loons, they were feeding their chicks almost exclusively freshwater invertebrates. So 94% of the diet was composed of freshwater invertebrates, very few freshwater fish, even fewer marine fish. Once in a while, the male would come back carrying marine fish. More often than not, it was too large for the chick to eat and the chick gets dropped it and the male ended up eating the cell. Um, so this is an interesting comparison. You know, these loons are feeding their chicks these little packets of energy. You know, those invertebrates don't, carry, don't have much uh, energy in them, but they're feeding them constantly. So provisioning rates for Pacific loons are very high. They were feeding their chicks nearly all the time which is an interesting contrast to red-throated loons, which are feeding exclusively marine fish, which is what we'd expect. 
um, that the most common fish we observe fed to broods was be cisco, which is a very high energy density fish. So they're feeding their broods less frequently, but these big packets of energy that they have to travel farther to get and bring back to the brood. So the interesting part of this is thinking about how the available prey enables the parents to meet the energy requirement of their chicks, of their brood. Um, so to do this, we looked at three hypothetical diets. So a low energy diet that for red-throated beans was composed only of capelin, uh, average energy diet, which was the average composition across species of the diet, and then a high, high energy diet that was composed of only slender eel blending. We knew provisioning rates, so we used the maximum provisioning rate uh, from the observations to see, given that maximum provisioning rate, what's the maximum amount of energy that both parents could provide their brood in a day. And that's what we're calling maximum daily energy intake here. And as you'd expect, it differs among diets. So the interesting difference is that the average diet is pretty similar to the high energy diet uh, with the low energy, energy diet much lower because capelin don't have uh, much energy content. We also know how much energy it takes to meet the chick's requirement. Um, so when chicks are growing, they need energy to maintain, you know, for basic functions of maintenance, they need energy to stay warm, they need energy to move around, and they need energy to grow. And there is one day during the entire postnatal period when they're growing that those demands reach their maximum value. And we, we measured that um, in a different part of the study, so we know what that value is. So when we look at that peak daily energy requirement, and then we compare how well the three diet types met that requirement, you can see that the average energy and high energy diet nearly met or exceeded that peak energy requirement for the brood. Uh, low energy diet did not, not surprisingly. So this is saying that um, as long as there's some high energy fish available, red throat boons are, are gonna do okay. If those high energy species aren't around, and they're faced with this low energy diet, then um, brood survival is gonna be lower because they can't meet their brood's energy requirements. And what did that look like for Pacific loons? So here, the low energy diet is all uh, freshwater invertebrates. The average diet is the diet we saw from observations, 95%, 96% invertebrates, and then the remainder in nine spine stickleback, and then an all nine spine stickleback diet. Uh, and you can see that there's a big difference between the high energy diet and the average energy diet, given the provisioning rates that we observed. How does that compare to the maximum need of the brood? That maximum need of the brood is easily met with the high energy diet. Um, but under the average energy diet, some even under the average diet, some chick mortality is going to occur. So this is a situation where there's going to be some brood reduction, where a brood of two is going to be reduced to one chick because the energy requirement of both chicks can't be met. And in fact, that's what we saw. So during the three years of study of the study, red-throated moon chick survival was essentially 100%. 71% um, of red-throated red loon broods fledged both chicks. Um, in comparison, uh, Pacific loon chick survival was lower and only about a quarter of Pacific loon broods were able to fledge both chicks in the brood. Looking at, looking at that in terms of productivity, so the number of chicks fledged per pair, uh, both red throated loons had much higher productivity because they had higher chick survival and nest survival was similar for both species. Even though productivity was lower, for Pacific loons, it still exceeded the value required to maintain a stable population. So it's lower productivity, but still good enough um, to prevent a population decline. So now I'm gonna start the hand-waving part of my talk and think about the high variation in red throated loon population abundance and the comparatively low variation in Pacific loon population abundance. It may be that red throated loon populations are tracking the availability of high quality marine fish. 
So when there are high quality fish, they fled, fledge lots of young that survive and recruit into the breeding population. But when the high quality fish are not available, uh, for example, due to changes in the marine environment, uh, like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which can lead to sudden and dramatic changes in fish composition, red-throated loons don't fledge chicks at a, at a high rate. Um, and over a sufficient amount of time, that will lead to population decline. Um, if that lack of availability of high quality fish affects adult survival, it's gonna to lead to population decline much more rapidly. And uh, Joel has a paper on red throated loon survival that the results are suggestive that adult survival is correlated with the availability of, or at least ocean conditions. Um, Pacific loons, on the other hand, they're feeding their chicks freshwater invertebrates, which aren't great, but they're good enough. They're good enough to fledge one chick. And the abundance of invertebrates in lakes that don't have fish in them are probably pretty stable. For from year to year, by late summer, those lakes are going to be teeming with invertebrates. So it's a stable population of prey, a stable source of prey for Pacific loons to provide their chick. Perhaps that's why their populations are stable while red throated populations are more variable. So this is not an explanation that the, my data demonstrate directly, but it is one they do suggest that certainly warrants further research. Uh, another part of the story is differences in body size. And here are representations of the three species and how they differ in body size. Uh, Pacific moon is half the size of a, a yellow-billed moon and a red-throated moon is half the size, about half the size, a little bit more of a Pacific moon. And body size has consequences. So here are their math, the distributions of masses, red-throated loon, Pacific loon, and yellow-billed loon, and their corresponding cost of flying. So this is the minimum amount of energy needed to be expended for a bird of that this mass of these masses to fly based on aerodynamic equations, uh, showing that being small has a benefit if you have, if you fly. So flying takes less energy for a red-throated loon than it does a Pacific loon. So this might explain why Pacific loons can fly to the ocean to feed themselves during incubation, but the repeated flights that would be required to feed a brood of chicks during the entire postnatal period might be just too difficult for adults to meet their own energy demand and that of their chicks, uh, given the cost of flight for their higher, higher body mass. Uh, and I just wanted to end with a, a few slides on general loon conservation. Um, and this is a, a, a repeated theme in the straight science series that you know climate change is having impacts. So both the marine and freshwater habitats used by loons are being impacted by increasing temperature. Thawing of permafrost is leading to drainage of lakes as lake basins are breached. Uh, this is documented in this paper and many others. Uh, this paper is by David Swanson from the Park Service. Um, so loons are losing habitat that way. Um, also smaller lakes are getting deeper as their um, bottom fast ice thaws. So lakes that previously were too shallow to have fish because they first completely now potentially can. And if fish get into those lakes, it'll really have an impact on the availability of invertebrates in those lakes. Uh, and it might make more smaller lakes suitable for, for Pacific loons and increase the amount of competition between Pacific loons and red-throated loons. And given that Pacific loons are larger, they're likely to win that, that competition. Uh, the marine environment is also changing. This is work by George Devoki at Cooper Island, Yuri Piadvik showing that the availability of high energy Arctic cod has decreased as the sea ice edge has retreated farther to the north during the summer. And this change in prey availability has impacted black guillemot study studies there. Theoretically, there could be similar effects on red-throated loons along the Beaufort seacoast. And this is a question that Brian Rook and Chris Laddie are currently exploring with work they're doing on the coast of the Arctic National, Refuge, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge with red-throated loons. And then lastly, I wanted to end with gill, gill nets. So entanglements of loons and gill nets is a, a source of mortality for these birds. There's a commercial gill net fishery in the mid-Atlantic uh, that kills enough red-throated loons that it's probably having population level, infect, uh, population level impacts for at least for that Eastern uh, population. Uh, more locally, 
there are set gill nets used for subsistence fishing in Alaska. We know they also cause some level of mortality. Um, there was this review by folks at the Wildlife Conservation Society that looked at this and concluded that take of yellow balloons is within what was anticipated. Uh, it's not documented. We don't know how many red balloons are, are dying in, in nets. Um, but we are interested in finding out, you know, getting tangled in a net is not good for a loon. It's not good for the fisherman either who's trying to, to fill its freezer. So we're trying to understand how common these entanglements are. And we're also very interested in if any fishermen have come up with ways that they know to keep loons out of nets. We've heard of using uh, decoys or maybe buoys along the, the float line. So if there is any information of known ways to prevent loons from going into to gill nets, I am very interested in learning about that. And my email is here. So <clears throat> please uh, send me an email if you have some suggestions. Um, and that's all I have for this evening. So uh, thank you very much for sharing your evening with me and I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, if the audience is really savvy, they know how to put reactions down in the chat bar or um, we always ask the audience in Straight Science to give a, a lot of love to the speaker as well as ask your questions or um, because the speaker does get to, to read those after. So if there's um, ways to do things better, which I can't imagine in this talk that we just had, but it's always nice to have a little love for you in the chat. So thank you, Dan. It's your slide presentations to me just are um, really educational and very um, graphically pleasing. And then you added the sounds, which is great. You can't go wrong with Lou. Yes, so, yes. So that's thank a, good, you. a good reminder. One acknowledgement, those photos were by, by Ryan Askren, who's a spectacular photographer. So thank you very much to Ryan for sharing those with me. And we used one of them on the Street Science poster. So that, that Loon launching himself is exquisite. Um, you do have a first question in the chat box, and that is, are the age differences in the loons using the larger, are there age differences in the loons using larger versus smaller lakes? That's from iPhone. Yeah, that's a that's a tough question to answer. To start getting at age-related questions, you need banded loons and long-term data sets. And we really don't have that information. There's more information from common loons uh, and a bit of information. Uh, Brian has a paper on territory turnover in yellow billed loons on the Arctic coastal plain. And it, it seems like it works um, in terms of territory turnover. Um, you know, once you have a territory, you hold it and you're more likely to continue hold it, to hold it when you're challenged in the springtime until you get too old to hold it. And then there'll be a, a territory turn over that way. That often results in the, the mortality, the fatality of the male. Interesting. Um, you also have a, co a comment and a question from Colleen Reichmuth. Thank you, Dan. What a great talk and a combination of methods. Wow. I'm curious how you got to peak daily energy requirements for broods. Did you use direct observation or several question marks? Yeah, so the, you know that's a um, uh, bioenergetic model that's based on those observations. So we use those observations, and I didn't present these results, but we got measurements of um, provisioning rate, and we also looked at sources of variation in provisioning rate, um, and we applied those estimates of provisioning rate to the different potential diet types. So that's how we we got at that uh, maximum provisioning rate. And iPhone wanted to let you know that they are Lori, not just iPhone. Oh, hi, Lori. Um, so any other questions? Oh, there's questions coming in. Um, we did lose the caller partway through the call. I think that was from one of our communities. So I'm sorry we were we lost them. Yeah, um, next question is from Rafaela about bycatch. Do loons have poor underwater vision? Uh, that's a great question. And the more I learn about it, the more complicated <clears throat> it gets. That there are people, <clears throat> there's a graduate student that pre presents her work often at the Pacific Seabird Group that's really 
doing excellent work related to how some shearwater species are attracted to lights in the Hawaiian Islands. And there's like no one answer. Um, you know, it differs by species. And we're really just beginning to understand how birds see underwater. There was a really cool study working with cormorants off the coast of Chile, uh, trying to keep cormorants out of nets and they used LED lights attached to the net. And that basically eliminated bycatch of, of cormorants. So for a cormorant, it worked. Whether or not it would work for a loon, I don't know, but I would, I would love to try. But it seems like vision it can be pretty uh, specific to the species. That's an interesting question and a good answer. Uh, next question is from Mika Miller. Do you think loons are likely to have competition with waterfowl given their high use of invertebrates for brood rearing? That's a, that's a good question. Loons are grumpy. They don't get along with other birds. Um, and uh, if oh, I've seen many times a uh, hen doc lead her brood into a lake, a territorial lake of a red loon or a Pacific loon and immediately get chased out. Um, and there are, there are documented cases in the literature of loons killing uh, ducks and geese that come into its territory. Um, so I don't think that will be a problem because loons are, are, they don't mess around when it comes to defending their territory from other loons or from other species of, of birds. So that nice mellow bird you see on the lakeside, it'll take you down if you're a duck. <laughs> Be careful. Good to good to know. Um, someone wrote "murder most foul," F O W L. <laughs> bravo, bravo. Bridget, well done. Yeah. Um, let's see. Super talk, Dan. This is from uh, Suzanne Bishop, and and I'm giving a shout out back to uh, Fish and Game on on Suzanne. If that if I have the right Su Susan. Um, super talk, Dan. I'm curious how the chick survival is essentially 100% for, um, um, for red throats. Yes. If 78% of broods fledge both chicks. Yep. That's, so it's, uh, brood survival. So if I'm remembering this correctly, brood survival is the probability that at least one chick fledges from a brood. Um, but it's another interesting question as to why it was so high um, relatedly, and that's, I think, because they had access to the high quality fish. It's not always the case. So Joel worked on it, ran a study in the YK Delta with the student Jeff Ball, and Jeff's project almost didn't work because there wasn't a single brood over three years that fledged both chicks, and most brood, broods didn't survive the fledge because the chicks were starving. So the one, this is from Susan. So the 100% is brood survival, not chick survival. That makes sense. If I'm remembering it right, yeah, I have to get, get back and confirm that, but that's what I'm thinking. And then I want to give a shout out because I don't know how you say the first part, Piri? Piri. Piri? Mm -hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Gall are back and I'm so glad to see you on the screen. And um, they wish to say great talk, Dan. We now have a much, much better understanding of what you were doing up there on the slope. So well done. Um, they had to wait a while to understand it, but now they've got it. <laughs> so I'm glad you're back. Thank you very much, Mr. Mizigal. Hi from Nome. Um, any other questions from the group? It was a great talk and you've gotten some great questions. Yeah, uh, oh. Gay, this is Kate. Hi, uh, Kate. I have kind of a wordy question that I can't um, type in the chat and it's not okay it doesn't pertain exactly to your talk but it's about red-throated loon behavior and um, last summer I spent a lot of time watching a loon family in a small pond right on the Norton Sound coast and um, a lot of other loons flew over the pond and the pair I was watching and the chick um, would um, hunker and sometimes dive and go to the edges and hide, uh, particularly when other red-throated loons flew by. And so I was wondering um, about that behavior, if you can shed any insight on that. And then also another time, uh, right after the chick hatched, 
um, the female was on the nest still incubating another egg and the newly hatched chick was under her wing and the male was out in the middle of the pond and another loon just landed with a great amount of splashing high speed um, it was met defensively by the, the male on the pond and for about a minute they paralleled each other back and forth across this pond and then the interloper took off and I just was curious about that. I mean it seems like a lot of wasted energy and um, I just yeah wondered why those sorts of things happen. Those are, <laughs> thanks for sharing those, those are wonderful observations. Uh, I'm envious that you get such easy access to red-throated loons. Um, great questions. The, the first question, the overflights and the behaviors you observed when there was an overflight, loons are, are first of all, very territorial. Um, second of all, they don't breed, red-throated loons aren't breeding until they're three. So there's this cohort of kind of floating individuals that are looking for a place to set up they're nesting next year. And what better place than a, a lake that's good enough to fledge chicks from or to have chicks in. So the, the hypothesis is that these scouting loons are flying around, especially in late chick rearing, looking for potential territories to try to take over the next year. Um, and there's a lot of observations that support that for common loons. Brian where Cook has a, a paper on it from yellow, on yellow buildings and our coastal plain that also show that. So the thought is, you know, they're hiding their chick so that the, the uh, intruding moon doesn't see that it's a productive lake. Uh, and also there's a possibility that the intruder loon might try to kill this chick. Uh, they're very aggressive. So that relates to the first question. The second question, you know, that I think relates to the same thing that, that intruder was checking out that territory and, and testing that resident male um, to see if he, he, you know, sizing him up. What are my chances here? He sized him up and he said, my chances are very good. I'm leaving. And that's one thing that Brian's paper showed that for yellow balloons, once you have a territory, you know, it's 90 some percent chance that you're going to keep it if there's an intruder. Um, that so a small percent chance that you don't. If you're a male, it's probably not going to end very well for you. If you're a female, you're probably going to get displaced to a different lake. Great observations, though. Thank you. Fascinating. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And a uh, wonderful talk. Really enjoyed it. And uh, one other thing, um, just an, an interesting observation I made um, and wonder if you have seen this. The last um, two weeks before the chick uh, fledged from this lake, it spent a lot of its alone time chasing and catching dragonflies. Wow. Uh, yeah, there, there was uh, quite a hatch, a lot of dragonflies, and um, it was pretty successful and really motivated to catch them. Wow. That's a, that's a great, I would, that would be an amazing photo. That kind of relates to another thing we found with red-throated loons. You know, they're very different in that they have to go out to eat every every time they want to eat her. So the parents, the chick can't feed itself most of the time unless there are dragonflies around. Um, the parent, mean, meanwhile, is flying through the ocean and back carrying one fish at a time, which is a lot of work um, for the adult. And we found looking at chick growth in red throated loons that the chicks are fledging before, like when they only have like 65% of adult size. So their 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 wings are growing fast, but their body their body mass is growing slowly, so that they can the, the hypothesis is that they can gain flight before they're fully grown, and the thought is that they, they want to gain flight or the the um, selecting force that's motivating that type of growth is so that the chick can get to the ocean and the adult doesn't have to to feed it anymore, which is going to overall lead to an increase in productivity of the chick and possibly survival of the adult. So we've got, is that, that answer, Kate? It sure does. And I'll, I'll send you some um, dragonfly uh, hunting photos. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've got, Dan, I've got Dan's email if you don't, Kate. So one way or the other, we'll get them to him. Thank you. Um, you have two more questions. Are you holding up with the questioning? Because we're a little over, but all good. All right. So 
have uh, from from further north, have you considered using hormone analysis for feathers to monitor for energetic bottlenecks, especially in the red throated loon? Yeah, that's a, a great idea. Yep. So you can use uh, corticosterone, much like Hector Gagas talked about last week. You can use that approach, but looking at corticosterone from the feathers. Um, we haven't done that yet, but that is an excellent, excellent idea. All right. Um, and from Carol Gales, do the chicks stay with the adults after they leave or do they split up after they leave this region? <clears throat> so that's a good question. I think uh, we, from observations, we know that at least for a short time after they leave the nest lake, they're with their adults because you see, you can see them together. Um, based on satellite transmitter results, the adults initiate migration uh, a couple of weeks before the young do. So it seems like the adults start the migration, whereas the <clears throat> chicks stick around, probably completing growth before they start migration. So families eventually do split up. They stay together for a little while after fledging, but it seems like they they split at migration. It's not like a family of geese or or, or swans. All right. Thank you. And the last question of the night. Now, I'll preface this um, with in Western Alaska, if you're not from this region, in Western and Northern Alaska, homemade donuts are a serious, uh, a serious thing. And thus, you know, it's a big deal. You, you're not kidding. And everyone loves donuts, especially homemade ones. But the, that this was a, this was a contest at Nalakatuk. So this is a, a really big uh, celebration on the coast, um, especially up north. And donuts, you're a donut judger. That's no small feat to get that one right. And so the question from Tamara Zeller is, what were your favorite donuts? And I, I mean, go down into detail because if it, whether it had raisins or not, is it circular? Is it like a pie? I mean, those kind of things matter to us here. It's my favorite donut is a donut. Preferably, preferably a, don a homemade donut from Point Lay. That was a... Uh, tough decision okay whether they're served hot or in seal oh. oil versus vegetable oil i mean it gets down into the weeds but all right well well done and and you must be question. Um, thanks considered Tamar. a magnanimous if you're a donut judge well done not easy <laughs> so so with that the um the announcements at this end unless anyone has any other questions we should probably think about letting um um dan off the hook I have one, and, one if I could ask it. Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. I was very interested in that set of loons that flew to Korea. And then there was that one oddball who flew down to Baja, California. Uh, did I have that right? Yes, from the Arctic Coastal Plain, yes. Yes. And I wondered, did they ever track to where he went after he got to Baja, California? Or was he just didn't want to go freeze his butt off in Korea or what? <laughs> but he, he went back to Alaska after that. And unfortunately the transmitters, well, actually I think we got more than one winter of data from that bird and it returned to Baja California again the next year. Oh, he knew a good yeah. thing when he saw it. Okay, thank you. That's all.